the Baha'i really form the, the true litmus test of liberty, in, and especially religious liberty, in Iran today, and we'll hear more about why that is the case. Dr. Manoka. Well, good evening, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here in, in Zurich. I'm very grateful uh, to John and to Christian Solidarity International for this opportunity uh, to speak about uh, the subject of the uh, situation of the Baha'is in Iran and the nature of the persecution that this community has been experiencing in the land of its birth uh, since uh, 1979, uh, the implications, consequences of that persecution, and the unique uh, response of this uh, minority, uh, religious minority in Iran to the oppression that uh, it has experienced for these many, many years. And as John indicated, this comes at a time, this uh, consideration of this subject comes at a time of great importance uh, in the life of uh, Iran, in the uh, development of the region in general, uh, as uh, there are opportunities now provided um, for a um, significant uh, development in the political relations between uh, countries of the Western world and Iran. Um, and in this context, the uh, situation, the particularly uh, challenging situation, shall we put it, being experienced today by minorities in Iran. In fact, the right, the fundamental right to practice one's freedom, religion, or belief uh, must not be uh, overshadowed, must not be forgotten, uh, despite or in, in light of all the political developments that are taking place today, because the bottom line is Iran's record in these matters remains simply appalling. And I want to explain that in relation to the plight of the Baha'i community today in, in Iran. At the outset, I should say a couple of things. First of all, I am no expert in matters to do with Iran, its politics, its history. Uh, I'm just someone who cares very deeply about the uh, country because it is the land where the Baha'i faith emerged. And I am a Baha'i, and in my service, I, as you've heard, focus primarily on a campaign, along with colleagues in many other countries, to raise awareness of the ongoing situation of the Baha'is in Iran. So I care very deeply about it. So what I know is really about that, and even that I'm not a particular expert. So uh, I should really say also that these comments are tonight shared in my individual capacity. So I'm not representing the United Kingdom Baha'i community. I'm not representing the Baha'i faith or the Baha'i international community. So whatever I say, uh, I have to express with that uh, reservation, with that sort of qualification. Uh, so these are my, my, many of my comments will be personal comments and thoughts. Uh, many of them elaborated in the context of discussions with colleagues far and wide. And for that, and for their input into this, I'm most grateful. I think it's also important to say at the outset that there are many, many people in Iran who are suffering greatly today. Many religious minorities, linguistic minorities, ethnic minorities. I think of the gay and lesbian community. I think of human rights defenders. I think of courageous journalists and bloggers, uh, activists in the women's movement, suffering greatly. So are the Baha'is, but they're not the only ones. However, their situation is unique in that they are the object of a state-sponsored policy of persecution. Also, what is unique uh, about the Baha'i community today is the manner in which they've responded to a program of a potentially genocidal intent. And it is one of the few, if you like, documented cases where a a group, a population in such a situation, in such a context, has managed to uh, peacefully 
and constructively uh, resist such attempts to eliminate it as a viable entity uh, in a particular nation. Now, the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur uh, on Freedom of Religion and Belief, Dr. Heiner Bielefeld, last year uh, called Iran's persecution of the Baha'is among, as amongst the most extreme manifestations of religious tolerance and persecution in the world today. Others have labeled this persecution as uh, a campaign of cultural genocide, as an ideological genocide, or a suspended genocide. So you get a sense of the gravity of the, of the nature of this problem. I think a, a point to bear in mind before we go on to a, a further discussion of the issues is that since the start of the Islamic Revolution that uh, swept into power uh, the regime that stands today, um, the the ideas, the beliefs that define that regime's nature and character are unmistakably theocratic and religious. It uses its power uh, to maintain, if you like, a control of the public square in religious terms. Those who veer outside that, those whose beliefs are different, uh, are in great uh, peril. Um, their human rights are conditioned on what they believe, on what they profess, on, if you like, what they hold to be true within their conscience. This, if you like, takes the process then of othering, the fact that you don't believe what the majority believe to the extreme. It is a form of religious apartheid, if you like. And of course, it breeds fanaticism, it breeds violence, and in the case of the Baha'is in Iran, this approach, this process, has been enshrined in the very law of the land. They are literally outside of the law. They have no place in the written constitution of their country, and their persecution stems from that central fact. So they have indeed become, as one commentator stated, a people within a state, yet legally without a state, in terms of state protection, while being all the while a target of that state. They have been defined outside of the uh, universe of moral, ethical, and legal obligations of the dominant majority population in Iran. Now, although other minorities around the world have sadly been subject to similar or even greater levels of persecution. As was just alluded to earlier, the manner in which the Baha'is have responded uh, to this campaign of genocidal, near genocidal, potential genocidal intent, they, the may they've managed to deal with this uh, othering, uh, has focused on an entirely constructive and non-oppositional approach. And this, in turn, raises a number of questions worthy of further reflection, questions I would like to uh, at least touch on tonight, and perhaps we can discuss in, in conversation after the presentation. So how, for example, in the face of a coordinated campaign to eliminate their community, have they uh, issued the mantle and the label of victimhood? Faced with persecution of such ferocity and intent, how have they prevented the seeds of resentment and bitterness and hatred as a result of their treatment from taking root in their individual and collective consciousness. How, and more importantly, why, have they declined to utilize the tool of political resistance, confrontation, 
adversarial opposition, political demonstration, as well as non-violent civil uh, disobedience uh, and other approaches in response uh, to this persecution. So what I want to spend some time on in the second half of the presentation, having reviewed the nature and, and scale of the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, is um, to explore how certain elements of the Baha'i conception of religion have informed a particular understanding of the process and requirements of social change that has underpinned the response of the Baha'is in Iran to persecution. And it's in the hope that this experience will provide some insight into how religious minorities um, can strive to retain their integrity in the face of the bitterest opposition uh, and perhaps then uh, be a useful contribution to the ongoing discussion, not just of the plight of religious minorities in the Middle East and throughout the world, but also on the role that religion itself can play in the Middle East uh, at a time of great turbulence and change in that region. Now, by way of background, the Baha'i Faith, for those who are not aware of it, was founded in Iran in the middle of the 19th century by Baha'u'llah. Uh, who was born uh, by the name Mirza Hussein Ali and took the title Baha'u'llah, which is Arabic for the glory of God. He claimed to be uh, the divine messenger for this age of human maturity. He taught there was only one God and that each uh, religion, each divine revelation represents uh, a stage in the successive unfoldment of God's will and purpose to humanity. The faith's social teachings include the full equality of the sexes, universal education, the elimination of prejudice, the harmony of science and religion. But its most pivotal teaching, its most central teaching, if you like, revolves around the promotion of unity and justice in the context of increasing global interdependence. The Baha'i faith is uh, one of the most um, diverse and globally distributed uh, steadily growing, um, if you like, uh, communities of people on uh, religious or otherwise on the planet today. Uh, the worldwide Baha'i community embraces some 2,100 different ethnic, racial, and tribal groups, and Baha'is will come from every religious background and no religious background. The faith itself has no clerical or ecclesiastical order. Rather, it is organized uh, through a system of elected councils at the local, national, and international levels. And these bodies uh, are a means for challenging, channeling the energies of Baha'is in service to the common weal and for organizing the religious and social affairs of the Baha'i community itself. Now, this system of governance, uh, which is very active and is a central, integral part of Baha'i life and Baha'i practice, does, however, not imply the, um, uh, in any way the existence of a political agenda. Baha'is are loyal and obedient to the governments in the lands in which they reside. They do not engage in partisan political activity, although they care deeply for society and engage in activities uh, for its betterment, but they refrain from any activities that would spread sedition uh, or overthrow a government in which they reside. And this is important when we come to talk about the situation in Iran. Yet, despite these uh, peace-inducing uh, commitments, despite this approach to work for the common good, the Baha'i faith has been bitterly persecuted in the land of its birth. And not just in recent years, but from its very inception. In fact, one could say that the Baha'i faith, uh, when it emerged as the Babi religion, was born in an orgy of blood. Written accounts of European eyewitnesses uh, at this period record followers being stoned to death, 
having their teeth torn out, their eyes gouged out, being forced to eat amputated parts of their own bodies, having lighted candles inserted into their flesh while being led in chains through the streets. It doesn't make for any pretty reading or hearing, but those are objective accounts of the treatment of the early Baha'is uh, at the hands of the religious and civil authorities of Iran. Now this persecution continued intermittently during the 20th century, coinciding with uh, the need of various governments to uh, shore up support from certain elements of their country's Islamic leadership. The pattern, if you like, was one of low, was an ongoing low level of harassment. Uh, legal discrimination, social marginalization and exclusion interspersed with pogroms of killings, torture, and other acts of physical violence against Baha'is. Uh, the establishment of the Pahlavi regime in 1927 until 1979, saw this pattern of persecution being increasingly instigated by central government. It was no longer just something which happened locally, something which became a little bit more organized. And a policy of discrimination was formalized uh, against the Baha'is as a concession to the clergy. So Baha'i schools were closed, Baha'i marriages were not recognized, Baha'i literature was banned, uh, Baha'is in public service were either demoted or sacked. Occasional mob violence uh, took place and communal property was confiscated at times, sometimes worse than that, even destroyed. However, this stands in, in marked contrast to the picture that emerged in 1979 with the establishment of the Islamic Republic. When the elimination of the Baha'i community was no longer just a question of instigation by the government, it was state-sponsored. It was an, became an ideological goal of the regime itself. The Baha'is live throughout Iran. They're not localized in a particular city or town. They come from every ethnic background in Iran, every class, every religious background. The Baha'is are Iran, if you like. So the persecution has been from the cradle to the grave. Baha'i children abused in school, harassed by their teachers, bullied. The elderly, um, well, uh, raids on Baha'i homes or homes where Baha'is reside, el homes for the elderly. Baha'i graves desecrated. Baha'is killed, tortured, disappear. Baha'is thrown out of their jobs in the public sector. Baha'i businesses revoked, ration cards withdrawn, passports denied. Um, Baha'is unable to access higher education. Baha'i cemeteries destroyed, holy places destroyed, bulldozed, razed. The Baha'i administration dismantled. A full ranging persecution from top to bottom, from north to south, from east to west, throughout the land of Iran. Now, when the Constitution of the Republic was drawn up in 1979, uh, certain rights, certain rights of minority religions were indeed cited and protected. And I think of the Christian, the Jewish, and the Zoroastrian population. However, no mention of the Baha'is, the largest religious minority, in fact, uh, larger than the sum of the other religious minorities in Iran. So this, in legal terms, means what? It means Baha'is are persona non grata. They have no rights of any sort. They can therefore be attacked and persecuted with impunity. Um, much of the current Iranian legislation, the constitution <laughs> as drafted, um, is drafted in such a way that fundamental civil and political rights are conditional on membership of one of four faiths. 
So nowhere will it say the Baha'is have no rights, but it will say that the following rights belong to those who are recognized in the Constitution. Baha'is, by definition, are not recognized, hence have no rights. That's, that's a very superficial uh, reading of the Constitution. I think time doesn't permit us to go into a full legal examination, but I'm more than happy to do so if there are any questions along those lines. Um, what is also very evident is the practice of courts over the years since 1979. The courts of the Islamic Republic have consistently denied Baha'is the rights to seek redress, to seek justice, to seek protection against killings, assaults or theft or confiscation of property by ruling that Iranians who commit such acts against Baha'is are not liable for their actions because Baha'is are unprotected infidels, heretics, those whose blood may be shed with impunity. And these statements uh, are recorded in written transcripts of court judgments. These days, they don't appear because written judgments are not given to Baha'is for fear they would be disclosed and that pattern would be, again, for all the world to see. So we have a strange situation in Iran. The laws, the regulations, the practices established by the government of Iran, by its judiciary, demonstrate an irreconcilable tension, if you like. A desire to abide by the rule of law, but, on the other hand, to uh, an intent to discourage, uh, eliminate membership of the Baha'i faith on the other. So the result, is you, if you please, is an institutionalized policy of discrimination against the Baha'is, an institutionalization which allows the government to claim it is merely upholding the rule of law, whereas in reality it's upholding the rule of a fundamentally discriminatory law, one that it has crafted with an obvious objective. Now, in the years immediately following the establishment of the uh, Islamic Republic, um, some 200 or so Baha'is were executed, were killed, and the full litany of, of human rights abuses um, took place. Um, what then happened was through the uh, efforts of Baha'i communities around the world, uh, the plight of the Baha'is in Iran came to the attention of national governments, of the United Nations, of civil society organizations, uh, of prominent personalities, the media. And there was, as many of you are aware, an outcry, a condemnation of what was happening in Iran. It's culminated in 1985 with the first resolution adopted by the General Assembly, specifically citing the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran. The Baha'is in Iran themselves had sought locally and nationally to seek justice in Iran, but that was denied. So the only alternative was to appeal to the international framework of legal and moral norms to seek uh, justice. And that was pursued through uh, Baha'i communities uh, around the world and including Baha'i offices at the United Nations in New York and in Geneva. This international pressure worked. It worked to the extent that it mitigated the full, against the full ferocity of the onslaught of the Iranian state. By the late 80s and early 90s, the number of executions, accounts of torture, disappearances had dropped significantly. So what happened? The Iranian regime continued with this relentless course of persecution, but there was a tactical rethink and a shift from the overtly physical to the social, cultural, economic strangulation, quiet, behind the scenes, but make no mistake about it, with the same intent, with the same purpose, with the same goal in mind. 
And this motive was clearly illustrated by the coming to light in 1993 of a memorandum drawn up by the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Cultural Council, signed by the Supreme Leader, who is still the Supreme Leader today, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, to deal with what was termed the Baha'i question. And this document remains a current policy of the Iranian government. It hasn't been rescinded, it hasn't been repealed. And it calls for the progress and development of the Baha'i community to be blocked. Yes, it makes certain concessions. Baha'is were given passports. Ration cards were returned. Certain superficial changes were brought to bear. But if you read on, you come across some very troubling statements. For example, this one, that um, the Baha'is must enjoy the means for ordinary living in accordance with the general rights given to every Iranian citizen. You think that's pretty fair? But only to the extent that it does not encourage them to be Baha'is. Further, the memorandum goes on to state that all Baha'i should be expelled from universities, that they should be denied positions of influence, that they are to be denied employment if they identify themselves as Baha'is. And then ominously, the memorandum declares that a plan must be devised to confront and destroy the cultural roots of the Baha'is outside the country. So that Iran would like to reach outside its borders and stamp out the Baha'i faith makes clear the degree of hostility, hatred, prejudice that the government feels towards the Baha'is. So this policy of, of quiet, ongoing social economic strangulation, harassment, has continued uh, to the present day. Um, indeed, since 2005, one could say this has distinctly intensified. And sadly, too, has the more overt physical manifestations of the persecution in terms of the rising number of violent attacks against Baha'is, uh, which are clearly documented and which represent a very worrying trend. We've seen a dramatic surge in the number of Baha'is arrested and detained. In 2004, there were just four Baha'is imprisoned in Iran. We've just heard from John today there are about 136. Um, in August 2010 alone, 320 Baha'is had been arrested up to that point in 48 in prison. Um, now we have 731 Baha'is uh, who have been arrested. Um, more than 550 of them, uh, 550 Baha'is who have been previously arrested, um, have subsequently been released and are either waiting trial or to call to begin serving out their sentences. In 2008, a very notable development, of course, was the arrest of the seven former leaders, the, the, former, the individuals who used to make up the ad hoc national leadership group of the Baha'is in Iran, the so-called Yaran, the Friends in Iran. Each of these seven was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, the longest sentences handed down to any prisoner of conscience in Iran. Economic restrictions are in full force. A wide-ranging media campaign aimed at nothing less than inciting hatred against the Baha'is, a campaign of steady, systematic vilification uh, continues today. The use of inflammatory terminology, false accusations, um, has very disturbing parallels with other state-sponsored anti-religious campaigns of the past. Another very worrying and troubling development is the extent the Iranian authorities at various levels have made to identify and monitor Baha'is, to track them down, to know who they are, what they do, where they live, how they can be found. Again, these are all clearly documented. And in recent months, um, we sadly have to uh, report uh, two incidents of what are unmistakably uh, religiously motivated murders 
or murder of a Baha'i in Bandar Abbas last August, and the attempted murder of three Baha'is in their home in Bir Jand in northwest Iran just two months ago, both occurring against a backdrop of increasing uh, um, incitement of the local populations in the media and from the pulpits against the Baha'is. Now, we also are probably aware that in, in recent months since the election of President Hassan Rouhani, there have been um, calls, uh, well, statements by the president to the effect that Iran seeks to improve the rights of all its citizens. It cares deeply for them and it seeks to ensure that the citizens of Iran have the human rights that they deserve. And so this is encouraging. But the facts on the ground are tell a very different story when it comes to uh, minorities in particular, but for general, generally speaking, huge sections of the population. Uh, in last November, President Rouhani released a draft charter of citizens' rights. The charter was posted on the presidential website and would convey the impression, or would appear to convey the impression, that Iran is indeed committed to upholding human rights for all. But the truth is that this proposed charter is limited to the members of heavenly religions. And the Baha'is are outside of that definition. So the facts on the ground speak of a methodical, stepwise intensification of human rights abuses against the Baha'is, the numbers in prisons, uh, the increasing numbers of arrests and detentions, the social discrimination they face, the fact there's no mention of them or provision for their rights in this draft charter, no Baha'i prisoners have been released, an old fatwa issued by Ayatollah Khamenei uh, prohibiting Muslims from associating with Baha'is was reissued on the eve of the president's inauguration. These all point to a further clampdown on the rights of the Baha'i minority in Iran. Now, you may ask, what is the rationale for this persecution? Why, why this wide-ranging, ongoing, bitter persecution? Well, the Iranian government has at various times, when asked, uh, stated that there is no persecution going on. The Baha'is are not persecuted. That they enjoy full rights in Iran. However, if they are forced to admit there's an issue there, they would say, well, the Baha'is are not being persecuted for their religious beliefs. Baha'is are only uh, imprisoned, only executed, because they engage in criminal activity. What is the criminal activity? The criminal activity is of a subversive kind. Why do you call it subversive? Well, because the Baha'i faith is not a religion. It's a seditious political movement. It is a dangerous sect. It is allied with certain foreign powers. Sometimes they'll say it's the British, sometimes the American, sometimes the Russians and Soviets. Many times it's the Zionist uh, regime in Israel. These are agents of foreign powers who would bring down this government and its people. They are the enemy within. They're the enemies of Islam. Yet the truth is the Baha'i faith is a religion that accepts Islam. It reveres the Prophet Muhammad. It declares the Quran to be a holy book of God, to embody the word of God. That these truths, that, that these accusations are not truths, but fallacious statements is made very clear when in documented cases all a Baha'i has to do to prevent execution, to reclaim their job, to access higher education, to stay the hand of the torturer, is to simply recant and profess allegiance to Islam. And the only charge 
that was upheld on appeal against, uh, by the prosecutor in the case of the former members of the Yaran was that of tending to the spiritual and social needs of the Baha'i community. The only charge that was eventually upheld against them, showing again that the basis for this is religious. But why? What is the issue here? Well, the emergence of a post-Islamic, post-Quranic religion is viewed, has been viewed, by certain sections of the Shiite establishment as being theologically abhorrent. It is unacceptable. It is a conceptual menace. Because you have declared that one religious era is over and another one has opened. And that is a threat. That is a threat not to us, not only to our logic, our interpretive logic of how we understand religious, uh, religion to evolve and to be, if you like, but also our place at the very heart of that order. Our privileges, our endowments, our fame, our name conditioned on the role we play within the system. You take away that system, you challenge that system, we have nowhere to go. So we will hold on to it. And not just hold on to it, we'll make sure you don't exist long enough to threaten us. Furthermore, the progressive, modernizing, revolutionizing, radical, Uh, teachings of the Baha'i faith, the full equality of the sexes, the uh, abolition of a clerical or ecclesiastical order, strike at the very heart of uh, the um, attachment to teachings that uh, certain groups within the Shiite Orthodox establishment would wish to preserve at all costs. So, over this time, through inciting mob violence against Baha'is, through systematic attempts to discredit the history and teachings of the faith, to vilify it, to seek to dehumanize it, uh, its members, by cultivating a climate of indifference, by silencing those who would be sympathetic and supportive uh, of the Baha'is within the wider population. Um, The Baha'is have been uh, left on the margins, on the periphery, and easy targets for those who don't know the full extent of the history and teachings and message of the Baha'i faith, and who otherwise, if they did, would speak out Uh, for it and in defense of it. Now, having um, attempted to outline some of the history of the persecution of the Baha'is, the current, uh, if you like, form it takes, uh, and the the reasons why it it happens, I want to say something about the Baha'i response to this pattern of persecution. And this can only be done by drawing on some of the vision and principles of the Baha'i faith itself. Um, And this is is not going to be an exhaustive treatment of the subject by any means. And in presenting these ideas, I I acknowledge the uh, work done in this area by Professor Michael Kahlberg, who is a professor of communications at the University of Washington in in the United States of America, who has thought very deeply about this and has... uh, articulated a a very interesting uh, approach and understanding, if you like, of how the Baha'is approach to social change underpins their uh, response to opposition and oppression and persecution in Iran. The Baha'i response to persecution um, needs to be understood as stemming from a conception of religion itself 
as a source of vision and principles and values which together with science propels the advancement of civilization. It is common to view religion as a welter of competing sects and denominations, each with their own set of personal beliefs, particular customs and prescribed practices. This, however, is not a comprehensive reading of the phenomenon. Religion can also be understood as a continually evolving uh, system of knowledge and practice representing the spiritual experience of the human race. Some of its truths remain eternally valid, while others uh, speak to specific uh, historical conditions and contexts and which require renewal as civilization advances. As the human race in the Baha'i view is a single species, so too is the instrumentality by which God cultivates our minds and hearts. And in the Baha'i view, this is part of one unfolding process. Indeed, the founders of the world's great religions can be regarded as great reformers who awaken humankind to its capacities and responsibilities as part of a process that is not simply repetitive, but progressive. Too often, views about religion carry with them notions of division, strife, and repression, creating a reluctance to turn to it as a source of knowledge in addition to belief, even among those who question the adequacy of entirely materialistic approaches. The Baha'i writings proclaim that all men have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization and that the aim of every religion is to effect a transformation in the whole character of mankind, a transformation that shall affect both its inner life and external conditions. So inspired and informed by this vision, religion is understood as a transformative power which can unlock human potential for the betterment of society. Now the Baha'i understanding of religion as a single evolving civilizing process is rooted in a wider understanding and conception of the course and direction of human history itself. Humanity, in the Baha'i view, is approaching the crowning stage in a millennia long process which has brought it from its collective infancy to the threshold of maturity. A stage that will be marked by the oneness of humanity becoming the organizing principle of human affairs. Not unlike the individual who passes through the unsettled yet promising period of adolescence, during which latent powers and capacities come to light, humanity as a whole is in the midst of an unprecedented transition. Behind so much of the turbulence of contemporary life are the fits and starts of humanity struggling to come of age. This process of transition, this period through which we are currently living, will unfold over many generations. So the Baha'i approach to social change, including its response to persecution opposition, is pursued with this long-term perspective in mind. And therefore, it inculcates on the part of the Baha'i as a spirit of perseverance, of patience, of faith. Now, for the Baha'is, unity is not just only this goal, this objective to be attained. It's also the power and the means through which the processes of fundamental change leading to the unity of mankind will be progressively realized. So the principle of the oneness of humankind is a principle, is a value that should um, uh, infuse all aspects of life on the planet. It is not, I should say, uh, merely a expression of goodwill, of noble sentiment, of fellow feeling, a warm and fuzzy, wonderful thing to, to embrace. It applies right across the board. It applies 
in our interpersonal or to our interpersonal relationships in the family environment. It applies to our relationship to our natural world. It applies to the economic and political life of the planet. It not just should inspire us to live a better life at one with others and therefore to think about our actions, our attitudes on the life and well-being of others and to align ourselves with those which will uh, are more conducive to wider human happiness, but also has profound implications of relations between nation states, between classes, between races, between religions. It affects the external conditions of humanity as, as much as it does the internal inner condition of a human being. It implies an organic change in the very structure and fabric of society. Now, this vision of unity as both the ends and the means has a very profound implication of the Baha'i attitude towards social change, which is namely that there is and there has to be, if any of this is to be coherent, a consistency between the ends that are sought and the means by which they are pursued. Simply put, um, a noble goal cannot and should not be achieved through unworthy means. So, in all that Baha'is do and strive to do, they cannot uh, be seeking to establish patterns of thought, of action, that it give expression to the principle of the oneness of humanity, yet engage in activities and efforts in another context, which to whatever extent reinforce an entirely different set of understandings and assumptions about human nature and social existence. So, the upshot of all of this is that instead of responding to persecution and oppression and opposition through any means that are in and of themselves confrontational or oppositional or adversarial, Baha'is pursue a different path. On the one extreme, issuing violence, violent protest, political opposition. But on the other hand, also uh, not engaging in acts of non-violent civil disobedience. Not on the one hand equally to succumb in resignation, to uh, glory in being a victim, equally not to take on the characteristics of the oppressor, him or herself. So in summary, the Baha'i approach then, in light of the teachings, the vision and principles and values of its faith, of the faith, is to respond on developing approaches, on methods and instruments that concentrate on that which can bring about lasting change and transformation, spiritual and material, concentrating on revitalizing hearts, minds, behavior, the structures of society, working on developing a, a model of, 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 of being and of doing, a pattern of activity, a pattern of thought, uh, of, of behavior, of conduct, relationships that can offer hope to society, a practical way of life that can attract others and inspire them to believe that even under the most difficult conditions, such as in Iran, there is another way forward. Now, integral to this approach to social change and responding to persecution is a rethinking of certain foundational concepts. And one of these is a concept of power, which is often seen, traditionally seen, as a, as a means of uh, domination, of control, of coercion, uh, together with all the accompanying notions of contest and superiority and division and contention. 
although uh, not naive in the least about the operation of power, Baha'is seek to think about power in terms of tapping into, releasing, channeling, and enabling the powers of the human spirit. The power, for example, of unity, the power of love, of humble service, and of pure deeds. So in this view, power is not a finite entity, a product, uh, a resource to be won, to be seized, uh, to be jealously guarded by an elite. It's something which resides in the very body of humankind itself, waiting to be tapped, waiting to be utilized, waiting to serve the overriding uh, principles of unity and justice. Now, it would be useful to think about how the, um, the Baha'is in Iran have themselves uh, drawn on these ideals, have drawn on this vision, have drawn on these principles and values in their own uh, contribution to uh, their country, in their own uh, attempt to withstand uh, opposition and persecution over many, many decades. And I think the experience of the Baha'is in Iran, uh, given it is the oldest Baha'i community in the world, given that for a long time it was the numerically largest Baha'i community in Iran, the most developed Baha'i community in the world, rather, um, it provides a unique glimpse into the efficacy of a distinctively non oppositional approach to social change. Take the field of education, for example. In the 1870s, individual Baha'is established a few modern schools in rural villages in northern Iran. And in the late 1980s, established the Tabayat School of Tehran. And these schools gradually multiplied throughout the country providing education not just for Baha'is, but for all citizens of Iran. They proved immensely popular, but they were also among the best academically. For instance, in a 1913 government examination, 30 of the 33 students of the Tarbayat school passed, while only 10 of the 300 students from other institutions of Tehran uh, doing so. Committed to the, full, uh, to the principle of the full equality of women and men, Baha'is founded the first school for girls in Iran open to people of all faiths and backgrounds. Now, these schools were eventually shut down by the government in the early 1930s, but they had already by then gone on to train the first ever generation of professional women in Iran, leaving a lasting impact and influence throughout Iranian society. Within the Baha'i community itself, Baha'i women in Iran, under the age of 40, had achieved 100% literacy by 1974, compared to the national average of 15%. In addition, Baha'is have contributed significantly to fields such as agriculture, health, and industry, all of which have accrued to the benefit of the nation. Specifically, since 1979, when denied employment, higher education, other rights of citizenship, Baha'is, inspired by the same vision uh, of their forebears, have attempted to establish creative means to ensure their survival. So some Baha'i entrepreneurs were able to set up uh, businesses uh, and employ Baha'is who had been barred in the public sector from working, but also had had their businesses shut down. The Baha'is in Iran also were able to set up informal systems to care for elderly Baha'is who had lost their pensions, to educate Baha'i children who'd been expelled from schools. And in response to denial of higher education imposed on their youth by the Iranian authorities, established their own open university, a virtual decentralized 
Institute for Higher Education, a process described by the New York Times as an elaborate act of self-preservation. But beyond the tending to their own uh, internal needs and possibilities, the Baha'is in Iran have also continued to serve the needs of their fellow citizens. But even those, unfortunately, have been attacked by the government. And one example was the arrest of 54 Baha'is in Shiraz in 2006 for participating in literacy, teaching to underprivileged children, and then the arrest of a number of Baha'is in 2011 for providing education to the children of Baham following the devastating earthquake in that region. All of this points to a community that has provo that's proved uh, and shown itself to be strong in the context of severe conditions up to the present day. And in so doing, ensuring that the oppressors have never been able to establish the terms of the encounter. The Baha'is have not forsaken their beliefs, they've retained their sense of constructive agency, remain forward-looking, dynamic, and vibrant, and unyielding in their commitment to serve society. They continue to forge their own history having rejected the label of victim, inspired by their teachings, press on as a living entity to advance the interests of all, ultimately, in Iran. Now, as said earlier, we are at a fascinating place. We're at a place where a new space in Iran would appear to be opening up. A space that potentially uh, seeks, clearly seeks, a renegotiation of terms with the rest of the world. A expressed avowal to return to the family of nations. And this poses a unique challenge for our part of the world, for all nations, to respond. But sadly, as documented only in the last few days by the UN Secretary General and the UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran, and by plenty of evidence coming out of the country, there does not appear to be a change in the long-standing attitude that the Iranian government has towards uh, freedom of thought, conscious conscience, religion or belief in that country. And in this regard, there has been no change to the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. Indeed, it has been worsening. So what are we to do? Well, I think we're to ensure at least one thing, that if we care sufficiently about the rights of all on this planet, but particularly those who are defenseless, those who continue to remain oppressed, then we need to register that concern. We need to speak about it. We need to inform others. We need to continue to educate ourselves so that we can make sure that human rights, and particularly the fundamental right of freedom, religion, or belief, is not and is never sacrificed at the altar of political expediency. We've been down that road too many times in the past, and we need to learn that lesson and to apply it now. The situation and future of religious minorities in the Middle East and elsewhere is often analyzed through the prism of geopolitics, of international legal norms and instruments, socioeconomics, history, and cultural issues, and a range of other internal political dynamics in the states where minorities reside. These are all important approaches and have their value in the ongoing discussions of religious minorities and issues of freedom of religion or belief. However, as I've tried to do in this presentation, 
it may be also useful to think uh, that the possibility that at its heart, uh, these challenges, the challenges faced by religious minorities in the Middle East, particularly, involve ultimately conceptions of religion and its role in society. Societies in which religious minorities, including Iran, are persecuted, often see religion as an element of identity that separates them from non-believers or from other believers. Religion is static, literal, and dogmatic. Religion that is about conferring privilege, exclusive and final access to truth. Religion whose ultimate aim is to control and impose its ideals on others. And although these are not clearly sufficient uh, to cause uh, or create the conditions for persecution, they are arguably necessary. So if there's one message I would also like to convey this evening, as well as the call to not forget the case of the Baha'is in Iran, to continue to shine the light on their plight, is this, that perhaps what we really are talking about and what we really need to think about are the underlying assumptions of certain conceptions of religion, uh, as well as reflecting on the ideals of true religion and true religious life and purpose, and examples of where religious lives can satisfy the aspirations of people to live in cohesive, flourishing, and peaceful societies. So to this end, I would suggest that the experience of the Baha'i community of Iran uh, in the manner of its response to persecution illustrates the power that conceptions of religion can have in motivating individuals and entire communities to constructively attempt to contribute to society even under the bleakest of circumstances. Thank you very much. <laughs>